Good morning, everyone. I'm Madhav, and I'm a student of class 10. Today, I'll be talking about the Collard's conjecture. To begin with, Collard's conjecture was introduced by Lothar Collard's back in 1937. It's also known as the 3x plus 1 conjecture or the Syracuse problem. So, the statement of the conjecture. The conjecture states that take any integer n. If it's even, divide by 2, and if it's odd, multiplied by 3 and add 1. So, this is what the meaning of the conjecture is. So, what is a conjecture? A conjecture is any opinion or a conclusion which is formed on basis of incomplete information. What does particularly the Collage conjecture mean? The Collage conjecture means, as I said earlier, take any integer n. If it's even, you divide by 2, and if it's odd, you multiply it by 3 and add 1. The Collapse conjecture simply states that starting from any integer, doesn't matter what it is, if we follow the rule above, if we apply the Collapse conjecture to it, we are eventually going to end up at 1. So, Hailstone sequences. So, as you know, Hailstones tend to bounce up and down, right? Because the updrafts of fr freezing air cause tiny hailstones to rise and then they accumulate as layers of ice. Because of the heavy weight, they fall down. And when, the, when all the ice is removed, they rise up again. This process continues until the hailstones are too heavy to be lifted up again. And this is why they fall to the ground. So imagine you've been given, to an, given an integer and you have to apply the collage conjecture to it. And when you apply the collage conjecture, you get a certain sequence of numbers. So what would you call that those certain sequence of numbers? Uh, you could call them the Collard sequences. Well, they are also known as the Hailstone sequences. Because imagine you have a certain integer and if it's odd, so you have to multiply it by 3 and add 1. So you'll get an integer. And imagine if it's even, so you have to divide it by 2. So suddenly there'll be a huge difference gap between those two numbers. So what I, what I mean by saying this is that the difference between those integers will be huge right so they'll be bouncing from small numbers to large numbers and again from large numbers to small numbers like the hailstones the second similarity is that as every hailstone eventually falls to the ground every collage conjecture eventually attains the value one so for instance n is equal to one so let's take the integer one and it generates the periodic class sequence 1, 4, 2, 1, 4, 2, 1, 4, 2, and so on. So there's something strange here. Why is it repeating itself? So that's because it's been proven that the class sequence reaches the value 1. And once it reaches the value 1, it will indefinitely, you know, revolve around the same three numbers 1, 4, 2, 1, 4, 2, 1, 4, 2. So, I mean, imagine you apply the class conjecture to a certain number. So once you've applied it and you have attained the value one, it is indefinitely going to revolve around the same values, one, four, two, one, four, two, one, four, two, again and again. To get this better and understand this better, let's take an example. Let's take the integer six. It generates the class sequence six, three, 10, five, 16, eight, four, two, one. So now we have attained the value one. So then again, one, four, two, one, four, two, one, four, two, one, four, two. And it goes on like that. So, this is a common thing to notice in any collage sequence that once you have attained the value one, you'll probably get the same three numbers, one, four, two, one, four, two, one, four, two. So now I'll be playing a short clip to explain what the collage conjecture is. Jeff Ligarius, a mathematician I admire a lot, thinks it's one of the hardest problems around. Erdős actually said, this is a problem for which mathematics is perhaps not ready. It turns out all this fuss is about a problem that any fourth grader can understand. To show you how this all works, I'm going to give you an example. Brady, choose a number between 1 and 10. I shall go for 7. All right, let's start with 7. Now, I'm going to apply two rules depending on what number I get to. I'm going to do this in succession. And if n is even, then I'm going to take n and divide it by 2. If n is odd, then I'm going to take n, can't divide it by 2 and get a whole number, so I'm going to take n and multiply it by 3 and add 1. Those are my rules. And I'm interested in what happens to n. Does it grow to infinity? Does it get small? 
Let's see what happens with 7. 7 seems to be an odd number, so I multiply by 3 and add 1. 3 times 7 is 21. Check me on this and add 1 is 22. I go to 22. 22 is certainly even, so I'll divide by 2 and get 11. 11 is odd, so I multiply by 3, getting 33, and add 1, get 34. 34 is even, I divide by 2, and I get 17. So, so far it's sort of going up and down, but 34 was the biggest yet, so maybe it's headed off to infinity after all. 17, so 17 is odd, I multiply by 3, 3 times 10 is 30, 3 times 7 is 21, 51, plus 1 is 52, even, divide by 2 and get 26, still even. Divide by 2 again and get 13. Now it's odd. Multiply by 3 and add 1. 40. 40 is even. I divide, I get 20. I divide again, I get 10. I divide again, I get 5. Boy, we fell down a long way. Maybe we're heading for a small number after all. Multiply by 3 and add 1, I get 16. Whoa, 16. Very even number. I get 8. I get 4, I get 2, and I get 1. If I do it again, something interesting happens. I go 3 times 1 plus 1 is 4. Whoops, I'm back to 4, but now I'm just going to cycle forever, going through 1 over and over again. So I got to 1. 7 got to 1. Now, people have tried lots of numbers beginning this way, and so far, all of them have gone to 1. They've tried roughly 2 to the 60th numbers. That's almost 10 to the 20th. So the famous Collatz conjecture says that every number, every whole number, will eventually get to 1. And a huge amount of work has been done on this problem by combinatorialists, by number theorists. This is the problem that maybe mathematics is not ready for, but that any fourth, fourth grader could play with and try, right? Try some numbers. First of all, we'd like to understand what's happening in such a way that we can say for certainty that every number, all the numbers we haven't ever tried, will get to 1. You could just try this on your computer. It's a good test for your personal computer, too. How fast a program can you make? Here's a little hint. Every time I take an odd number and multiply by 3 and add 1, I get an even number. So why not take two steps at once to 3n plus 1 over 2. Combine those two steps when I get an odd number. That speeds things up a bit. And there are other tricks like that. So people make graphs like this, and they're called trees, right? They've, so far, all the numbers go down to 1. But we might start with another number. If we started with 5, we already see what the answer would be. Any number that appears here, we already know the answer. We don't have to do it again. What's the first number that doesn't appear here? I think it's 6. Shall we try 6? Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, 6. And 6 goes, well, it's even. Goes to 3. 3 goes to 10. Have we got 10? Whoops, there's 10. So I should just draw the 3 going down to 10 instead. And now I know I'm beginning to build up my tree. I've tried now all the numbers up through 7, uh, 8 I've got, 9 I thought I had somewhere. Didn't I have a 9? No, I don't see nine. Let's try nine. So nine, okay. Odd number, three times nine plus one, 28. 28, 14, whoops, seven. Where is my seven? There it is. Goes to seven. So I can begin doing this and build up my tree. I don't have to go all the way each time. I know what's going to happen after I get to seven. If you look at the cover of this book that I showed you first, that's a tree of just this kind. But people have built up huge trees of this kind. And there's a wonderful article in Wikipedia that you can look at which shows some of the, the pictures of this. There, there does seem to be a very striking feature of it, and this is this line down the middle here. That's right. This is like the third rail. Once you touch that line, you fall right away to one. Jeff Legary. <clears throat> okay. So further on, he was just talking about some other areas of mathematics where the problem has been linked to. So right now, let's look at what some of the mathematicians who've worked on the Collage conjecture for a very long time and have some great thoughts on it have to say about it. Terence Tao, he says, you could get obsessed with these big famous problems that are way beyond anyone's ability to touch and you can waste a lot of time. 
Shizu Kakutani. For about a month, everyone at Yale worked on it with no result. A similar phenomena happened when I mentioned it at the University of Chicago. A joke was made that this problem was part of a conspira- conspiracy to slow down mathematical research in the US. Paul and those. So mathematics is not yet ripe enough for such question. Jeff Lagarius. So Jeff Lagarius, he's the author of the book, The Ultimate Problem 3x plus 1, which the mathematician in the video was talking about. So he says, this is an extraordinarily difficult problem, completely out of reach of present day mathematics. So when the mathematicians who've worked on it for such a long time, who have explored collapsed conjecture in a broad manner, if they have things like it's out of reach of present day mathematics or probably no one can solve it. So, I mean, if they say things like that, why should we try to solve it? I feel because, you know, it's a pure intellectual challenge. It's a benchmark for testing our understanding of number theory. So by, by that, I mean is, you know, when the collapse conjecture is just numbers. So you have two equations, which is three and plus one and n divided by two. And then you go on and on and on. But when you dig in and you get to the roots of the problem, so you go in different ways, you explore different things which a problem has been linked to. And then you, I mean, you, you know, automatically get to know different things which, are, with the, which the conjecture is, you know, linked to. And then, so that's something where the benchmark lies. So that's something where you can test your knowledge for number theory. So proof attempts have linked the problem to other areas of mathematics. So, you know, right now we don't have any answer or any proof or any number which is not applicable with the Kulas conjecture. So, things we can only find is, you know, proof attempts or something like a partial result. But, so this point means that the Kulas conjecture leads us to different areas of mathematics. It's just not multiplying and dividing things. It's way beyond that. And, you know, it can lead us to computing devices or it can lead us to, you know, AI or something like that. The word unsolved, uh, that's an interesting thing because, you know, since no one has got any number which is not applicable with the collapse conjecture, that means no one has yet solved it. So it remains unsolved. And, you know, whenever someone hears the word unsolved, there's a strike in their brain that, okay, it's unsolved. So why don't pick it up and just try to solve it? Because, you know, just play around or just explore the problem. It is a simple but not trivial toy model of a dynamical system. So that's a complicated statement. So it's a, it's a simple problem. That's pretty obvious that it's extremely easy to understand. It's not trivial because it has some variables or terms that are not equal to zero or an identity. So like three and plus one is not equal to zero or any constant or n by two is not equal to zero or any identity, right? And it's a toy model of a dynamical system. By that, what I mean is it's not so usual in present day mathematics. We don't have a lot of problems like that. It's, it's a rare problem. So the other problems which we face or, you know, which we explore in such high level, they are not so alike, like the collapse conjecture. So imagine you've been given a problem and you have to solve it. You have to find the value of X. So you work on it for two days, for two weeks, for two months, and you don't get any answer. So what do you do? So you look for things which would lead you to the answer, which would lead you to, you know, get the value of X and you look for things which can help you. So what would you call them? So it's not exactly the answer. It's partially the answer. So you could call it the partial result, right? And you'd also look at obstructions. So what I mean by obstructions is you look for things which are, you know, interrupting you to get to the answer and not letting you to find the value of X. So such things you could, you know, just call them obstructions and find them so that you can avoid them while you're working on the problem. So what partial results and obstructions do we have for the collapse conjecture? So partial results. In 2017, 
so a computing project it verified that the last conjecture gets along or is applicable to any number up to the value of 10 to the power of 20 so that's a large number and it verified that class conjecture is applicable to 10 to the power of 20 secondly one way the class conjecture would fail is if there is a cycle so by that what i mean is so in my earlier slides slides i stated that you know once you attain the value one in any collage sequence you 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 know revolve around the same three numbers one four two one four two one four two and imagine if you get any other cycle except of that that is one way in which you can prove the conjecture wrong or simply discard so obstruction for instance one mod if one modifies score by sending an odd number n to 3 and minus 1 rather than 3 and plus 1 then two additional cycles appear so Cole is the graphic representation. Okay, so imagine if you represent the class conjecture or a class sequence in a graph or in a you know graphic representation, you would call that map a cole. Okay, to simply you know get things easier. So, so the first point, the first obstruction demonstrates that you can't simply change the conjecture. You can't change three n plus one to three n minus one or you can't send an odd number to three and minus one. And even if you do, you'll have these two cycles, which are simply not what the collage con conjecture has. So I think the point basically means that you strictly need to stick to what the conjecture has in it. I mean, the equations, the three and plus one and n by two, you can't simply modify it in your own way and then you know, pretend to that, okay, I've solved it. I've, now we can easily discard the conjecture. No, it doesn't work like that. Okay, the second. So it's a fairly complicated, the second point is a fairly complicated one, but let's try to understand it. There are fractal program sequences for which it is undecidable whether they will ever reach a certain target value N. So before I demonstrate, I mean, I explain what the obstruction means. Let's understand what the what a fraction fractal program is. Fractal program is a computer language invented by John Conway, and fractal is every program like it's which is in which every program was a variant of a class function call. The output of sequences could be used to perform mathematical computations. So roughly speaking, this means that any compute computations or computing uh, research which is done by any other computing device can also be done by a fractal program. So the um, obstruction demonstrates that there is no general algorithm that can definitely resolve all the questions resembling the collage conjecture and any solution to the conjecture must use special properties of the collage map code. And, and they cannot be shared by the fractal program. So by that, I mean is the fractal program doesn't get along with the collage conjecture. Yes, it is made for solving such questions and equations and, you know, helping the mathematical research. But then the strange part is the collage conjecture doesn't get along with the fractal program. Okay, so now it comes to what do I feel about the whole conjecture? I have two things to say. First and the most important one is that I feel that the collage conjecture shouldn't be known as a collage conjecture. It should be known as a collage theorem. That's because, okay, so as I said, a conjecture is an opinion or conclusion which is formed on, in, in, I mean, it is formed on improper or incomplete information, right? So I don't think there's any incomplete information here. And I don't think the collage conjecture can be ever proved wrong because it worked till the numbers up to 10 to the power of 20. The conjecture is applicable to any number up to 10 to the power of 20. And if it is applicable to any number up to 10 to the power of 20, then why wouldn't we for any other numbers ahead of ahead of that, right? I mean, what's going to change? Nothing's going to change. The conjecture is going to stay the same. The way we do it is going to stay the same. So I don't think the conjecture won't be applicable to any number up to, I mean, ahead of 10 to the power of 20. So because of that, I feel the conjecture should be known as a collage problem or a collage theorem. 
Okay. Second point. So it's a short one. It's like, you know, it's a very, very simple problem to understand. But if you dig in it, if you get to the roots, it's extremely difficult or, you know, you face such, uh, such variations of the problem, such, such, uh, such things which you are not really aware of. And, but it, you will really enjoy it once you start, start exploring. And it's incredible to know where the problem leads you to. It's actually very interesting to know that the, a simple conjecture, which remains unsolved can lead you to, you know, computing devices, tracking programs and things like that. So yeah, that's my view on, on the conjecture. And so before I put the presentation to an end, I would like to mention something. Okay. So if you notice my first slide and my last slide, so there in the background, I put these threads kind of designs, right? So these are not just designs. I mean, I've, I haven't put them because they look beautiful. I mean, of course they do, but it has another reason to it. So it's like the mathematician in the video mentioned that uh, we, we can form maps with the collage conjecture by connecting them to each other. So we don't have to do it again and again, right? So these are collage maps, the white one and the red one. So, I mean, so what, what here, what has been done is the numbers have been removed and it has been, you know, clicked from an angle where it looks like a design and for us, you know, for, to get such an image and yeah. Basically, it's a collage map, both of them. So, yeah, I really enjoyed putting this presentation together. Thank you.